I'm going to show you how to draw the resonance structures for sulfur trioxide. This is the Wikipedia page for sulfur trioxide. I'm going to assume that you already know how to do the Lewis structure for sulfur trioxide. So let's start there and then let's figure out how we can go through all the different Lewis structures uh, that are representations of uh, resonance structures and we'll talk about what they mean. So remember that oxygen and sulfur are both in this uh, column 6, as it's sometimes called, or the 16th column of the periodic table. That means they both have 6 valence electrons, and um, I can easily create the Lewis structure for this. I just draw sulfur as a central atom, and 3 oxygens around it. And remember on our Wikipedia page, we saw that they had two bonds between each oxygen and the sulfur. Um, but remember, we started with six valence electrons from each of these atoms. There's four of them, three oxygens and one sulfur. So that means it's going to be four times six, or 24 valence electrons, and they're not represented here. So look at this. We have one, two, three, four, five, six bonds. That's two electrons per bond. So that's 12 we're missing some electrons, right? We need to have 24 represented in this drawing, and we are going to need to add some lone pairs to these oxygens to get that to work out. Okay, so this is a improvement over what was available on Wikipedia. So remember, when you're drawing resonance structures, you really have to have all the valence electrons depicted, and that's a good place to start. Okay, so this is considered to be the best Lewis structure for sulfur trioxide. There are lots of different resonance structures that we can draw. And the way resonance structures work is that you move electrons around that are not single bonds. So you never break a single bond, but you might move electrons from multiple bonds around. In the Lewis structures that are going to be present or depicted for this molecule, you're going to be playing around with whether or not each of these bonds is a double bond or a single bond. And what you do to, to show what you're doing is you draw a curved arrow that shows the electrons moving from one, double, one bond to wherever they go. So let's say I move these electrons to a more electronegative element. Remember, oxygen is more electronegative than sulfur. You know this because if I look at the periodic table, oxygen is higher up on the periodic table than sulfur it's in a higher uh, row, so it's more electronegative. Um, I know that from periodic trends. So if I, I'm trying to draw a curved arrow with two prongs on the head, it didn't come out as nice as I would have liked. And, okay, so what that will do is it will create a structure that looks like this. Uh, I got to get rid of some stuff. So we, we got rid of that second bond in the double bond. And let me get rid of that arrow since it's already been depicted. So we've moved electrons to this oxygen. Now we have to figure out formal charges. So I didn't like do the calculations here, but we'll, we'll do that right now. So for formal charges, the way you do it is you Think about how many valence electrons the element had initially when it wasn't involved in bonding. And then you think about how many valence electrons it has now. And with formal charge, you assume that every bonding electron gets like split half between the elements it's bonded between. So when I think about this oxygen, oxygen starts with six valence electrons, right? Remember the periodic table? It's in that 16th column. It starts with six valence electrons. But here, in this drawing, oxygen has one, two, three, four lone pair non-bonding electrons that just are not shared at all. Those belong to this oxygen. And it also has these four bonding electrons depicted, two electrons each in each of the bond dashes. So four electrons shared between an oxygen and a sulfur, according to the rules, the formalism of formal charge, we're just going to say that those four electrons here, two go to the oxygen and two go to the sulfur. It's not exactly true. The oxygen is going to hog more of the electrons, but let's just go with that for the formalism. That's what everybody uses. So in the accounting sense, in the formal charge sense, this oxygen gets four electrons from non-bonding electrons and two of the four bonding electrons. So this oxygen 
has, according to formal charge rules, six electrons around it, or six electrons allocated to it, and it started with six. So its formal charge is six minus six, or just zero. It didn't gain an electron from being a unbonded element, and it didn't lose an electron. So it has a formal charge of zero. Similarly, the sulfur starts with six electrons, and it has one, two, three, four, five, six bonds drawn to it, three double bonds, or six bonds. That's 12 electrons, and half of those belong to the sulfur according to the formalism of formal charge. So sulfur also, in this drawing, has six electrons allocated to it. It started with six. It didn't gain or lose an electron, so it doesn't have a negative or positive charge. Here it's a little bit different. So we drew this curved arrow to indicate that these electrons have moved from this double bond to this single bond. So I'm going to show that these are both resonant structures as opposed to actually distinct chemical species by drawing a double-headed arrow. So when people draw this arrow, a double-headed arrow like that, um, what they're doing is they are uh, indicating that uh, it's a resonant structure and not like an equilibrium. In fact, I think I'm going to draw a few more because I just want to like, I'm going to have to draw more structures later, but I want you guys to see, you know, what I'm trying to draw better. So here's another example of that double-headed arrow. Remember that means resonant structure and that means equilibrium. So they are not the same thing. All right. So don't don't think of that. Okay. So this is resonant structures. Uh, there's the first one here, the second one here. We need to think about formal charges because we've moved electrons around. We've moved negative charges around. That's going to change the formal charges. Um, so what, where do we move electrons from? We move from the sulfur to this oxygen. So those are the only only ones we really have to think about. So at this point, we have one, two, three, four, five bonds to sulfur. That's 10 electrons, but they're bonding electrons. So we're only going to say that half of those go to the sulfur and half of those go to whatever the other elements are that are bonded to that sulfur. So that's 10 bonding electrons divided by two. That's five. So this sulfur only has allocated to it five valence electrons. Sulfur starts with six. That means it lost an electron. If you lose an electron, that's like a positive charge, right? It started from a neutral, loses an electron, that means it has a positive charge. So this sulfur has a positive charge. There we go. Um, your teacher or your professor may allow you to have just like a plus sign like that. To keep myself sane, I draw a little circle around it. And in a lot of publications I've seen in chemistry, they have a circle around the plus to indicate that it's like a charge to make everybody's life a little bit easier. Um, okay, so at this point, even without doing any more math, I know I'm not done. Why? Check this out. These resonance structures do not actually create or destroy electrons. In fact, to be honest, in chemistry, no one knows how to create or destroy electrons. If you're drawing something that's supposed to indicate like a full representation of what's been changed or uh, a different way of thinking about the same collection of things, we don't create or destroy electrons. And we really don't. I mean, the closest thing we get to it is we have like neutrons that decay into protons and electrons and neutrinos. So uh, chemists don't really do that. That's more like nuclear chemistry and really it's more like physics. So here I'm thinking about this. I'm like, okay, the total charge here is zero, right? A whole bunch of things that have formal charges of zero, you add them up, total charge zero. Here, as depicted so far, I have zero, 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 and plus. So the total charge for this structure is plus, total charge before is zero. So we have violated conservation of charge. We have more work to do. There's gotta be some offsetting negative charge to offset this positive charge. It's gotta be on this oxygen. So sort of just by process of elimination, I could say that that's gonna be a minus charge. But let's do the math just to make sure that you get it. Um, so that's actually kind of a neat point I didn't know I was going to make, but I'll make it right now. So uh, you can actually double check. 
when you're doing these resonance structures, your formal charges, because if you do all your formal charges independently, they have to add up to what the total charge was before in the other resonance structure. So here we have a oxygen with two bonding electrons and six non-bonding electrons. Those six non-bonding electrons automatically get allocated to the oxygen full, like fully, so it's a full electron per non-bonding electron. But these two bonding electrons only get half allocated to the oxygen, the other half goes to the sulfur. So according to formal charge, that means the, this, these really only count for one electron. So that's seven electrons allocated to that oxygen. Oxygen starts with six. That means from elemental non-bonded oxygen to oxygen in this situation, it gained an electron from six to seven accounting formal electrons. So that means it has a negative charge. If you gain one electron, that's a negative charge. Okay, so that doesn't sound that exciting, but look, we just came up with two representations of the same elements with their valence electrons um, bonding slightly differently. Um, we're going to come up with a whole bunch more. Uh, I want to show you uh, some, some important points about these. Um, so let me come up with a couple more. So we, we could do the same thing um, by moving these, like one of these two bonds to this oxygen, instead of moving this one to that oxygen, we could do the same thing for this oxygen. So instead of having this arrow, um, this double arrow moving electrons from the bond to this oxygen, they can move electrons from this bond to this oxygen. So we're going to have three of these sorts of uh, structures, and I'll draw them out right now. So in each of these cases, we've taken one of the double bonds and moved it to a more electronegative atom that's adjacent to it, the oxygen. And we've created a formal charge separation between the oxygen and sulfur. And in fact, we could take it one step further for each of these structures. We could actually have this structure, for example, move a pair to this oxygen, or we could have this structure move a pair to this oxygen, or we could have this structure move a pair to this oxygen, and we get three separate structures. Again, I'll show you what that looks like. So each of, of these structures, each of these three structures, now has two oxygens with minus charges and only one doubly bonded oxygen. And the doubly bonded oxygen is in different places for each of these structures. So here it's the left oxygen, here it's the right oxygen, here it's the up oxygen. They're all the same otherwise. How did I get this two plus for sulfur? Well, let's think about the formal charges. So sulfur as an element non-bonded starts with six valence electrons. And here it's being depicted as having four bonds, that's eight bonding electrons. Remember, it's two bonding electrons per bond. And those are allocated according to formal charge rules, half between the sulfur and half between whatever elements it's bonded to. So of those eight bonding electrons, it only gets four allocated to it. So we have something that starts off with six valence electrons, and then two valence electrons are allocated elsewhere, so it has four net at the end. So that means it has a two plus charge. It's a formal loss of two electrons. So that's losing two minus charges, so that's a two plus charge. Now, notice that there's also a mistake that I made. So here I didn't do a good job in writing this top one, and I noticed for a couple reasons. So this top one, I didn't fix the formal charge for sulfur, which is awesome. So there I fixed it. Um, but there's clearly something wrong now because I have a two plus charge and a minus charge. So I need to have a minus charge somewhere else. And this doesn't make sense to me because if I count electrons, I don't get to 24 electrons. Remember, each of these resonance structures has to have 24 valence electrons depicted. This has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lone pairs and one, two, three, four bonds. So that's 11 times two, that's 22 electrons depicted. I need to have 24. What I'm missing here is the, like 
where these two bonding electrons went to, from here to here. From this resonance structure to that resonance structure, they moved away from the sulfur, they moved to this oxygen. That's some terrible curved arrow, let me try it again. Okay, that's fine. So, they moved to this oxygen, and in doing so, this oxygen now has two bonding electrons and six non-bonding electrons. So we're going to say that half of these, or one, goes to the oxygen, and six, all six of the non-bonding electrons go to the oxygen. So that's seven electrons allocated to it or accounted for on that oxygen. And oxygen starts with six valence electrons. So that means it gained an electron, it gained a negative charge, so that's a minus one negative charge. Suddenly it's all good because these two minus one charges and this plus two charge combine or overall make a charge for the entire uh, structure of zero. Not bad, right? So we have charge preserved here at zero, here at zero, here at zero, overall, right? Because we have a bunch of zeros added up to zero, a plus and a minus and some zeros added up is zero and a minus, a two plus, and a minus, and a zero added up gives you again zero. So that is excellent. Uh, it's a perfectly valid representation. Um, things I didn't do that would have made these wrong, I didn't violate the octet rule for these oxygens. You'll notice that sulfur can have a octet rule violation because it has more than eight valence electrons surrounding it, but oxygen cannot because it's in the second row of the periodic table. So carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, these elements, uh, they can't have more than eight valence electrons. If you go down to the third row, we make exceptions for them on occasion, but these guys cannot. So what this means is, is we're doing decent resonance structures. We haven't created or destroyed charge overall. We haven't violated the octet rule. Um, and we haven't like des destroyed or created electrons. They all have 24 valence electrons depicted. There is one more resonance structure we can draw, and that one comes from taking the remaining double bond and moving it to the oxygen. And I'll draw what that looks like. Okay, so this is what the structure looks like. You have this double bond. We can draw a curved arrow for it, uh, moving the electrons to that oxygen. And then you end up getting uh, an extra lone pair in this oxygen, creating a minus one charge formally on that oxygen and a plus three charge formally on the sulfur. So these are collectively the, I guess, eight resonance structures for SO3. Um, You have one that has three double bonds, you have one that has three single bonds, and then you have three that have one single bond and two double bonds, and three that have two single bonds and uh, one double bond. In real life, um, none of these, oh wait, sorry, to sum up, when you draw resonance structures, if you want to get full credit, make sure you draw these brackets around them. Um, so I want to talk about what these resonance structures mean, like physically what they mean, and uh, I will do so in another video. But uh, just to summarize, this is how you draw them out, and um, we've gone through how we could move these double bond electrons all over the place without ever breaking a single bond. So remember that all the elements that were bonded together still stay bonded together between all of these structures.